Um, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call uh, Ezekiel a historical novel. I would call it a um, uh, just just a piece of fiction. Um, like historical novels for me are novels that are entrenched in like first century Rome, for example. Like a friend, and she writes. She knows everything about first century Rome, and she tells her stories through that lens, and she won't leave that world. So, but um, for me, it was more an expression of the history of um, uh, what happens to the resistance fighters and how those stories were never told because the stories of resistance fighters um, are always uh, kept uh, between themselves or they're told, like the French resistance fighters, the older ones that continue to tell stories, like uh, the two characters at the beginning of the book. They will only go to schools where children are from the ages of 12 to 13, 14 because they feel that that's the time when history can actually enter into their consciousness. And after that then they get lost with like, um, you know, PlayStation or whatever it is, the games. Um, I, I'm not so much, you know, there's the usual suspects like, um, you know, all the writers like uh, Wallace Stegner or... Um, uh, it's it's hard to define what kind of books like I don't like when writing a novel I, I never read other novels I'm always reading nonfiction I'm always reading like thousand page books on the Holocaust or so it's more it's more um, the voices of uh, um, people who have witnessed these events or the historical uh, background of it um, because I think if you if you write a book. A novel or specifically fiction and you're too in the voice of other people then and afterwards when I look at it I go oh well that's kind of this I suppose but with Ezekiel I really tried to resist any kind of genre um, and any kind of um, the formulaic or uh, tropes uh, that you have in most of the different forms of fiction and I've written mystery fiction I've written so I could learn these things and then from those then and adopt them into the story so that I just know have uh, an idea of what en an engine is of an Australian novelist friend and he calls it the engine of a book so it doesn't really matter if nothing happens but the reader has to want to read to the end and so that's kind of why the, 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 the novel is framed with this couching effect of the historical bit at the beginning but it's in the present and then it goes back and then it re comes back into the present again so so I don't know whether I would have, um, going into it, it wouldn't be any literary uh, um, influences, but I suppose the literary influences of my reading of the last decades, you know. But. The dialogue uh, is a conflicting thing for me. Uh, like Hitchcock once said that like he, for, he was asked about dialogue, he said, uh, uh, so how do you write such great dialogue? And he said, well, I write, <laughs> I, I write the screenplay and then I get the actors and I get the storyboard down first and then uh, we go and go shoot the movie and then uh, when the actors are there then I do the dialogue. So his thing is about story gives you the dialogue. So uh, Ezekiel is kind of the opposite of that uh, idea of, of the and then story. You know, like what I was saying before about uh, the idea of genre and uh, this Robert McKee thing of genre in how that you um, uh, you have to know your genre if you want to break it down and go back so what I was trying to say is that uh, for me it's I keep the engine there uh, barely but I don't go into the and then of the dialogue so you know in movies they have the dialogue is is never really about what the scene is about like you have two guys drinking a cup of coffee and somebody's dead and the other one guy's coffee he says it's really hot and the other guy's fine but his is really hot because he just lost his wife. So that's that's not writing on the nose. So what I do is in this I kind of write on the nose which is not it's a kind of uh, forbidden uh, like a this use non-script or unwritten rule in writing. You don't write on the nose, you don't comment on what's going on right now otherwise it comes kind of like an Ionesco play or something. So what I do, did with this is, I get barely enough engine, but to get across what it is that these characters want to say about the situation in the world right now. So the dialogue, uh, when you use the word exposition, so uh, exposition for me is when it's 
something that's not um, part of story and for story freaks um, who like it's and then this happens and then this happens and here's the cliffhanger and then this happens which is wonderful um, but for this kind of a meditative book um, it's it's a different type of dialogue that then uh, comes out through the dialogue or c comes out through the story because the story is not like this so it's more you could say it is expository, but expository is a derogatory word for storytellers, um, and like the McKees and the pitch, the cinema and the genre um, writers. But I find it very um, a positive thing if you can continue your engine. And I think literary fiction is all about what's the engine that's driving me through to this story. Like if you do Chesil Beach, which you know, it's not my favourite novel, but he has a little engine, it's like, what the hell is going to happen to these two at the end? So he knows this intrinsically how to do. So the dialogue, and his dialogue is not on the nose. On the nose being uh, like too, um, uh, as you might say, exp expository. But, but I think it's important to get uh, that kind of a dialogue in because it represents, and dialogue is more active. So if I was to describe that stuff, how they talked in a paragraph, and then put in some kind of uh, vernal prose or, or verbal or verbose prose of like flowers and leaves or uh, ex that kind of expository stuff. You can kind of do it, but it's it gets you more into the action when you do the dialogue, it, as opposed to just describing what it is. And the, the reader will get bored then, you know. So hopefully it creates a flow. And it's interesting that you point that out because the I've never talked about that before, but I do use that as a tool to take the reader out of like just it being inside the head all the time of this character, you know. So the idea of language is, is really important um, uh, to the French, you know, because there are certain words in French that you can't really transpose or you, tra you can't uh, put them into English. And then some of the words are just so tied, it's like with the Irish language, there are certain Irish words that are just tied to place. So um, when Ezekiel talks about growing up on, in the Camargue, which is a very specific place where you have these French cowboys and these black bulls, and, and if you ever go and you see these manad, they're kind of like the Irish moil cows, you know, it's like very indigenous to the country. And the French are extremely proud of this heritage. Um, and they protect it, like the cows are actually a protected thing. Like just like, um, anyway, so the, that part, so when, it, when he talks about a herd of, of Camargue bulls, or Toro, they call them a manad, and you can't really say, because a manad is just specific to those type of bulls in that specific place. And uh, so when, I can't transpose that into the English, because it just wouldn't make sense uh, for that sense of place. So there's other words like... Um, there's a, there's a Norwegian um, novelist uh, called Per Pedersen, did that book, uh, Out Stealing Horses, and he gives that sense of, of space and, or place and talks a lot about how the place is very important, but the language, uh, the words that are attached to that place have a weight, basically. He doesn't specify a weight, but he talks about how the Norwegians have this kind of uh, sentimentality about the book because it talks about this place and these spaces that are um, very uh, an idea of a Norway that's gone. So I think the, 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 the words in it are an idea of France that's gone. Like the Manad is a, uh, like there's not as many um, Gardiens anymore. And, um, and they actually literally call them Gardiens. But if I translated Gardiens, these are the, bull, the, the cow, French cowboys. If I translated that into uh, like the guardians of the bulls in English, everyone's going the guardians. Like, what's that? Uh, you know, oh, it's a guardian angel or something. But actually, it has a huge religious um, background. So they actually are called guardians uh, of of a very uh, old history, and that is what I go into in in the book. Like even the 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 prongs that they have to drive the bulls when they're on their white horses. Um, has this Trinitarian, like a iconoclastic thing at the end. And even the cover of the book, that's actually a um, representation of the Camargue and the Camargue Cross. And each one of those things is symbolic. 
So a lot of these words are very symbolic, so I can't not put those words in um, into into it. You know, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like in the Irish the word uh, ishkabaha. You know, it's like whiskey. That you've lost all context now. Is use uh, ishka being water and baha being soul. So that's like uh, soul water. That has a completely different context then. And if we transpose that into English then, and uh, it's it becomes this, it all becomes lost. So you can't actually uh, transpose that. So, but you won't see contemporary Irish writers writing ishka baha in when it says whiskey because we've been anglified, um, because they took our language. The, the anglification of our language meant that we just don't have as much. Thankfully, we have Rakhine and all these other places in the West, you know, and so um, like the Gale talks, But in France, they still have that, so it's very much even more entrenched. They haven't; it hasn't been taken away. So it's very much a part of the language. And so for me, when I'm actually going to translate it back in, so my the person who basically inspired the book can actually read this. Um, uh, it's going to be another work in translating it back into French where I've actually used English words where they'd have actually more French context. So it wouldn't be just like translating it back into English, you know, or translating it, it into French. I have to use French words that don't mean the same as, or, or colloquial words in English that will not mean the same. So I think that's where the, the difficult thing is for translation. Like I've often read a lot of uh, or read books that have been translated from the English into French, or from the French into the English, and it's just, they do such, some of them are extraordinary, uh, but so many of them, they'll actually literally just change the whole sentence, like the first sentence, which is usually a very powerful thing in a novel, if you want to like have an impact, it's like, call me Ishmael, and then they say, my name's Ishmael, that's not the same way of, uh, it's like call me Ishmael, it's a, it's a direct action verb and you're telling them to uh, you know so it's like you, you, there's a loss of uh, there's a loss of uh, power um, in, the, in, the, in the expression uh, of the text or the, the intertextuality as you might call it in academic terms um, it gets lost I find and I think a lot of transpositions aren't done in a poetic way like Ishkabah is extraordinarily beautiful and and that's a simple example that just came in off the top of my head and it's like but there's so many others that are just lost like the language in reference of birds and the references to in the Irish language like all the references to cats and the references to specific trees it just gets lost and but um, hopefully that answers it. Um, I've learned a lot about the process of writing and the process of creativity because I've seen um, for nearly 20 years now in addition to that before that my friends who are writers in New York and in London and, um, or friends in Dublin as well way back <laughs> uh, it's it's that everybody has a different process and um, but the people who actually get things done are just hard workers um, you know, people talk about, I'm going to write a book, or I'm going to do a painting, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. But the ones, it was like there's a, an English writer, he once said uh, to me, he said, I said, how are you getting on with your book, you know, because we're always talking about, it, like, how's your thing going, how's your project going? And he said, uh, well, I just got to go back up those stairs again. And but it's very simple, and he's a pretty established writer, and for him it's basically, he just needs to go into the room and sit on the chair. And I don't know if it was Hemingway or Stegner or whoever, they said that um, they would have, like, it was three hours every day or two hours every day, and that they would stick to that. And they would, if they went into the room and they only did one word or one sentence, they still did their two or three hours. Because it's not like this, um, you know, nine to five existence where you work. Uh, eight hour day at work or a university or whatever whatever it is you're doing and uh, then you've done your day's work. When you're creating something you will get inspired and uh, you could work for a whole day or two days and you're just you've got this thing that's just coming into you and out of you which is another thing of what I've learned is the spiritual aspect of creativity. Um, but anyway, um, I'll talk about that in a sec but the other thing I was trying to to explain is just that the nuts and bolts of actually just getting something down is a lot about just 
repetition of um, and just doing the work. And but the idea of work not being this nine to five, because a lot of people think, oh, I haven't done eight hours today. Oh, I'm, I haven't done any work. But if you do eight hours, you, you're burning yourself out and you're not going to be able, to, except for those inspired moments. Um, if you're doing the eight hours, you're burning yourself out and then you're not getting qualitative work done. You're getting quantity, but a lot of the time people just throw it all out. So it's uh, just to know like what your process is. So yours could be four hours in the morning. Somebody else, it could be a Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky would write at night, you know, and... Auden would get up in the morning, he'd drink a martini, and then he'd write from was it, 4 in the morning or whatever mad hour it was in the morning, and he'd do his hours. But they both had the same process. They did it at different times. They had a specific amount of time that they, and every day they did that. And so that's how uh, we get this stuff down. And I think a lot of creatives are very resistant to even talking about that because they think it's some kind of magic or something that's attached to this. That I get inspired, but it's like who was it that once said, was it um oh who was it was it Henry Miller, or who was no it was um Theodore Mer Faulkner. He said they asked him I said how do you get inspired you know to write your books and he says oh I get inspired every day at nine o'clock. So he get, he's at his desk doing his work. So that's one huge lesson that I've learned over all these years. And it doesn't matter if they're artists. It doesn't matter if they're screenwriters. Novelists, children's book writers, historic writers, it doesn't matter what, the, what form it is that they're working in uh, or art that they're working in, it's always the same. They've got to put in the hours and when they don't want to do it, that's when they need to do it. So Stegner talks about it. He wrote this great book called um, on, uh, Notes from the East of Eden. Um, when he was writing East of Eden, he read, wrote to Pat Kovicki, who was his editor, and he's talking about how... Um, uh, he wanted to publish the book with the notes on one side and the novel on the other, but he's talking about these days, he'd get in on Monday into his office, he'd get nothing done. Now this is a very prolific writer, so that's one thing. But then the other part of it is there's a, there is this um, muse, to, you know, uh, la muse, muse, but there is a muse that comes, or inspiration, like inspiration basically means in spirito, from the Latin like in spirit, when spirit is inside you. So when spirit is inside you, that's what inspiration is. But to get to that, you have to be able to do your work. And work means you have to show up. Now, if you don't show up, then inspiration doesn't show up. And on a Monday, it might not show up at all, but you're just doing expository parts of the description of a scene or you're doing a bit of dialogue or something. Then another day, to Tuesday, it could be inspiration comes because you showed up at 9 o'clock. And that inspiration becomes, you know, Oh my God! I got this, you know, uh, thing that I, I never knew the character was going to do that. She kills her father. What? You know, it's like that never was going to happen. So that's the fun part of it. The work part of it's not as easy because your ego doesn't want you to do it. The the sort of spiritual part of it, that in spiritual part of it, is what's uh, what is where the good stuff comes from. But a lot of it's just hard work. You can be talented. I met many talented creative people. You just don't get the work done. And that's the unfortunate thing because they seem to think that it's this inspiration thing. And you try to say something about it, but it's a very entrenched, uh, it's like almost this propaganda or conventional uh, artistic ideology that's been given to people. It's like, oh, I'm going in and I'm going to write me a novel like Jack Kerouac in two weeks or three weeks. Don't talk about it, the fact that he edited it for two years afterwards or whatever amount of time it was. You know, oh, I wrote on the road like that. You know, these things don't come out of nothing, you know. So those are the two things I would say that from from that I've learned from all the creatives that I've had to encounter or have encountered through the muse, you know. It's been wonderful because you see it repeated again and again. Like, I have one writer that's there right now and, you know, wrote, like, the shitty first draft, basically, of a novel. You know, this kind of Anne Patchett thing of the shitty first draft. Um, which is just getting it all down and doing the work every day um, and was expecting that to come again but it's not always the same, you have to show up and so the first week very frustrated and, and uh, it's not happening but then after six days or so then it came, it started coming, it started coming but a lot of people I find give up after 
day three or day four in a thing unless you go on a retreat unless you get away from the telephone and the boss or the spouse or the kids or your other obligations then you don't get that flow of two days three days where you can let go of all that dross that ego dross so that you can actually get work done and a lot of people aren't aware of that idea of retreat they think of a retreat as some kind of spiritual uh, like gonna go and do the, the holy roller thing you know um, but it's it's not that it's a it's it's a retreat for you from life so that you can actually get into the thing that you love that you're passionate about